Big hand for Marshall here, guys. Big hand for the entire Chaos crew. These guys are great. Spend a lot of time setting this up for you. And of course, they're here late after we all leave. So I just wanted to thank every, you know, the entire team. You know, we start every seminar like that and we're gonna continue to do it. So one more time, just a big hand for all of the Chaos guys. All right, guys, we're gonna go ahead and get started again. My name is Captain Mike. I see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you so much for joining us again. And I also see a lot of new faces. So thank you for uh, attending our Extreme Seminars series here. I wanna just remind you of a couple of things real quick, bring you up to speed, and then we're gonna get right into our topic of conversation. Uh, right now, Florida Sport Fishing TV, we are airing on World Fishing Network. A couple of people said to me, hey, we don't see the show on Bally Sports any longer. After 12 seasons, after 12 years, we decided to go national rather than just regional. So right now, we're airing on World Fishing Network through the end of 2022. And then in January, we will begin airing on the Sportsman Channel across the country with our new season, our best season ever. So really looking forward to that. Simultaneously, we are producing and launching a second show called Captain Mike's Rigging Station, and that will air on Bally Sports Florida starting in January also. I uh, want to remind everybody to please follow us on Instagram at Florida Sport Fishing TV. You can keep track of what we're catching, what we're doing, you know, all sorts of good stuff. And finally, I encourage you to join our streaming channel, Florida Sport Fishing TV Plus. That's where you're gonna see all of our previous seminars. You're gonna get exclusive content, weekly seminars, and of course, all of the shows that are coming up and everything that we're doing will air on our streaming channel before it even airs on TV. So you'll have an opportunity to see everything there. That web address is fsftv.com. So, Please shut your ringers off on your phone because we are recording this seminar and it will be up on our streaming platforms and on our social network. We're also streaming this live on uh, Chaos's network as well. Okay, um, So just keep your ringers off if you don't mind. Also your questions, guys, I'm gonna try and cover as much as I possibly can in a short period of time. However, at the end of the seminar, I'll address any questions that you have. So just hopefully I'll, I'll answer them before you even ask them, okay? So let's get started here. Our topic of conversation tonight is twofold. It's deep dropping and jig fishing for queen snappers and snowy groupers. A Lot of similarity between these two species but also a lot of differences as well. Anybody ever catch a snowy grouper? By show of hands, handful of people. How about a queen snapper? Okay, again, just a handful. Who wants to catch more queen snapper and more snowy grouper? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, you shouldn't be here. Okay, let me just tell you that right now. So, first let's talk about the fish themselves. Queen snapper are perhaps the most glorified of all snapper species. They're just prized, they're beautiful fish, a bright crimson red, average five to 20 pounds, okay? A beautiful, beautiful snapper. They're available year round. You can catch them 365 days a year, you know, conditions permitting. The primary depth where you're gonna find queen snapper is gonna range from five to 1,500 feet, okay? And while 1,500 feet may sound extreme to you for deep dropping, that's not uncommon in the Bahamas for us to fish for the queens and water that deep. That's where the real big ones, the king of the queens, live real, real deep, 12 to 1,500 feet. For the most part, five to 800, 800 to 1,000 in that range. Keep in mind that queen snapper are you know, prolific and, and pretty popular around the Bahamas. We all know that. Anybody ever travel to the Bahamas to catch queens, right? Throughout the Keys, where I am right now, off of Marathon and Isle Morada, off of Key West, queen snappers are a common catch, okay? Very popular, highly targeted, and a common catch down there. Gulf of Mexico, way offshore, areas like Rankin Ridge, Pulley Ridge you may have heard of, Howell Hook, Queen snappers are popular. You know where queen snapper are not popular? Okay. Right here, right here. In 25 years of deep dropping and fishing outside this area, you wanna know how many queen snapper I've caught? 
Zero. They're not right here. So I'm not going to sit here and try and convince you that you're going to go out here and catch queen snappers because you're not. I promise you. Anybody know why there are no queen snapper out here? Because think about it. They're 50 miles away in the Bahamas. They're down off the Keys everywhere. They're in the Gulf of Mexico everywhere, but not right here. Anybody want to guess why that might be? What's different? What do we have right out here? Current. Not only do we have some current, we have the Gulf Stream. And that current rages at approximately five miles an hour, sometimes more. And it's just too much current for the queen snappers. Too much. That's why you can be out here daytime sword fishing. You could be deep dropping for you know, golden tile fish. You could be deep dropping for the black belly rose fish you know, that are common out here. And you'll never catch a queen. They're just not here. Okay, they really aren't. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Let's talk about the snowy grouper for a second. Because again, even though that's a bottom dwelling fish and we deep drop for the snowy groupers, they really, their habitat is different. They're a seasonal fish. And understand that August 31st, snowy grouper season here in the South Atlantic, federal waters is closed. So you've got, what's the date today? Okay, you've got about two weeks, less than two weeks to go catch and keep a snowy. Okay, and also understand that snowy grouper, the boat limit is one. You are allowed one snowy grouper per boat, whereas queen snappers, you are allowed five per person. Okay, keep that in mind as well. So the snowy groupers, predominant depth, 500 to 800 feet. That's really where you're going to find the snowies, not much deeper than that. Do we catch snowies in the Bahamas? No. Okay. Do we catch snowies in the Keys? Absolutely. Gulf of Mexico? Absolutely. Do we catch snowies right here? Yes. Okay, yes. So you do have an opportunity to catch snowy grouper right off the coast here. Okay, there's not a lot. It's not like the Gulf of Mexico or the Keys where they're much more prolific, but certainly you have an opportunity to catch snowies out here. So let's talk about how we do this because there's a couple of different ways. And understand that when we talk about deep dropping, we're usually, well, I don't want to say usually, but we're talking about fishing with heavy rods, electric reels, heavy weights, okay, and multiple hook rigs in deep water. That's pretty much the definition of deep dropping. And over the years, there's been a lot of debate over how sporty deep dropping really is. How much sport is it or how much skill does it take to drop a bait to the bottom and push a button? And all you got to do is push a button and suddenly you're going to reel up five fish this big at one time. Is that really what deep dropping is about? Absolutely not. That's the furthest from the truth. Even though we are using a power assist reel, it is still incredibly sporty. We have to find the fish. We have to fool the fish. We have to land the fish, you know, fight the fish and land the fish. And there's a lot of elements that are involved. So it can be very sporty. In my particular case, I've taken deep dropping to a different level altogether. And that's what we're going to discuss tonight. Look, if you're successful doing what you're doing and you're catching fish with whatever tackle that you're using, whatever grade or class of tackle, by all means, continue to do it. Tell me what's working for you because I always want to learn more as well. What I'm suggesting is that you listen closely to the details of what we're doing and how we're doing it and why we're doing it. And I'm certain that we can help you not only catch more, but enjoy deep dropping a lot more. Because really standing there just pushing a button on a big reel like an LP, one of those lingering Pittmans or a big, you know, giant electric reel and fishing with 10 pounds of lead just really isn't that sporty. Okay, it really isn't. So, Let's talk about what we do to prepare the boat for starters when it comes to deep dropping for these fish. Obviously, I don't need to tell you your safety equipment, plenty of fuel, because remember, you're dealing, you know, in areas that are well off the beach, you're going offshore, you don't know what might happen out there, you are dealing with current, you know, regardless if you're fishing in the Gulf Stream or not, you're always going to be dealing with some level of current, okay? And when you're Deep dropping, you're, you're 
doing a lot of drifts throughout the day. We're fishing a lot of different spots. So a lot of those is running back up for another drift into the current, which means we are going to burn an exceptional amount of fuel. So just take all of these things into consideration, okay, when heading out deep dropping. Bait. This is not the place for live bait by any means because any live bait for the most part that you put on a hook and drop to the bottom 800 feet down, what's going to happen to that bait? It's going to die. So why did I put a live bait on there in the first place? What is the most popular bait for deep dropping? Man, I love you guys. You guys got this all dialed in. I'm going home. Okay, done. Game over. Give me the check. So you're 100% right, squid is the staple of deep dropping because it's easy to obtain everything on the bottom, eat squid, everything. It's an easy bait for the fish to eat. Is it the best bait that you can use? No, it's one of the best baits, but it isn't the best. But you absolutely cannot or should not leave the dock to go on a deep dropping trip anywhere without squid. When you do pick your squid, make sure that they're nice and clean. Of course, you're going to be purchasing frozen squid. We all know that. Some guys are fanatical. They'll actually go to Asian markets and purchase fresh squid that has never been frozen or whatever fish market if they can get fresh squid. Is it necessary? No. But you do want a nice, clean squid. If you open up a box of squid and it's all bloody and mushy and gooey, do you want that squid? No, you wouldn't eat it. And if it doesn't look like something that you would eat, then certainly a trophy size queen snapper this big, 20 pounds, or a big snowy grouper, which can range from five to 50 pounds. If you want to fool these big fish, you better give them something that's worth them eating because it does make a very big difference, not only in this fishery, in all fisheries. So squid is a staple. Make sure you bring plenty of it because you may burn through a lot of it. Ideally, I like to fish the whole squid that are somewhere between six and eight inches. You know what I mean? Not the big giant swordfish squid. However, if all you can get are the big squid, that's okay too because they'll eat pieces of it. You can cut them in half or big strips or we like to take the head with all the tentacles of a swordfish squid. We rip the head off. And you know what that looks like? An octopus. And the bottom fish love that. The big groupers, they feed. They love octopus. So that's really what it looks like. And uh, that makes a great bait as well. However, I have to stress that in addition to the squid, one of the secrets to successful deep dropping for both queen snapper and snowy grouper is meat, fresh meat. Could be bonita. Snowies love bonita. The guys that are out here, the charter boats that are dialed in to catch in the snowy grouper are fishing, are fishing fresh bonita. They are not fishing squid on their hooks, okay? They're fishing fresh bonita. Down in the Keys, I have found that bonita is a great bait, but what does bonita attract? Sharks, right? And there are sharks, especially in the Keys, everywhere in two feet of water and 2,000 feet of water. They are everywhere. So anything that I can do to avoid those sharks, I'm going to do. So I don't really like the bonita. I like kingfish, fresh kingfish. So we'll stop on a rack or reef, and we'll try and catch a couple of kings, um, and we'll use that. And it really makes a very big difference. A big grouper, a 50-pound grouper, 30-pound, 40-pound, whatever, a big, giant, snowy grouper, Trust me, you ever see the mouth on one of those things? They could suck down a watermelon. That's the truth. So don't be afraid to put a nice slab of fresh bait on that hook because, again, you're trying to catch those big quality fish. Give them something that's worth them chasing and eating. So that's the whole scoop with the bait, squid and fresh meat, any combination thereof. Sometimes we'll fish you know, a multiple hook rig, which we're going to get into, and we'll certainly mix it up. Okay, we'll have two hooks with meat, one hook with squid. When we're fishing a three hook rig, sometimes we'll take a small squid and a piece of meat and put it on the hook. That's when we're specifically targeting the groupers, the snowies. 
And I'm going to go back and forth all night here to talk, you know, to talk, not all night, for the next hour or so, to talk about the two different species. When we're specifically targeting the queen snapper, we don't put a really big, bulky bunch of bait on the hook. We fish a nice, streamlined strip or one whole squid. A queen snapper does not have that same size mouth or the same ability that a big grouper has. You know, even, truthfully, you ever catch a three pound snowy grouper this big can suck down a bigger bait than a 20 pound queen snapper and they won't hesitate doing it. So they just have a little bit different feeding characteristics and feeding abilities. But I can't stress the importance of fresh bait. It's vital, okay? So when we're targeting the snowy grouper, if you're going to do it here, we know that snowy grouper are structure oriented. It is a grouper. It lives on or near the bottom, just like all other grouper. It does not move fast. It moves very slow, very methodically. And while it is a grouper, unlike a, we'll say a gag or a black grouper that really prefer to hide in a hole, okay, or under a ledge, the structure that we really look for is low line structure. You know, in other words, low profile. We want a rocky bottom, but we don't want it to come too high off the bottom. Okay, and on my Furuno sounder on my CV, I could read that fuzz. Keep in mind, on my fish finder, and I don't use chirp, okay, I can, on my screen, I split the screen. One side is top to bottom, the other side of the screen is the bottom 20 feet of the water column, zoomed in. So if I'm in 800 feet, I'm literally just want to see that bottom 20 feet, zoomed in. That's all that matters to me because that's all that I'm fishing is that bottom 20 feet when I'm targeting those snowies. I'm fishing anywhere from 500 to 800 feet. If I had to pick an ideal depth, it would be somewhere around 700 feet. 680 to 720 to be even more specific, okay? If you can find structure, the right kind of structure in that depth. Don't look for it here because you're not gonna find it here. Here you'll find the ideal structure in 550 to 580 is really what you're gonna look for in this immediate area. If you're down in the Keys where I am, again, it's gonna be deeper. It's gonna be that 680 to 720 for those snowy groupers. Now, most of you guys, I'm sure, when you're out there deep dropping, are used to taking a heavy deep drop rod and reel, and you take a heavy lead, average size lead, five to eight pounds, would you agree? A lot of guys will fish a 10 pound lead. You'll get out there to wherever it is that you're fishing. You might fish a five hook rig, and it's got a lot of schmeckla on it, okay? You guys have been to seminar before, I've heard that word before. And you know, some glow beads or some tubing or a glow squid, it's got all kinds of stuff on it to jazzy it up to catch you, not to catch the fish. And you drop that down with a heavy lead because you really need a, a, a heavy lead for that kind of rig. You drop it to the bottom, it hits the bottom, you lock up the reel and you drift. And you wait till you see a bite. Does that sound like deep dropping, right? Is that what most of you guys are doing? Okay. That is absolutely not how we deep drop. I wanted to take deep dropping to a different level altogether. I wanted to make it much more fun, much more sporty, much more active. You know, if I go out on the boat and there's a group of guys with me, it can get really boring to just watch one or two rods that are just sitting in rod holders. So I wanted it to be interactive. So I custom built a set of rods specifically for this purpose. And I want to talk to you first and foremost about the rod itself. And we went through numerous prototypes actually in order to get the perfect rod. It is incredibly light as you can see, okay. I've got the rod, it's rated for 30 to 60 pound. It has a super soft tip right there, very soft so I could see every little sniff every little bite. I could detect everything, but it's got plenty of backbone. And you can see that it's got this main guide right here, which is really high up off the blank. This way, no matter how hard this rod bends, that monofilament or braid will never touch that blank. 
Okay, so it was specifically designed for deep dropping, for active deep dropping, light under your arm. We're fishing this rod under our arm. It is matched to a Shimano Beastmaster 9000. This is the finest power assist reel ever created. I know a lot of you guys are familiar with the Daiwa Tanacoms. It's a great reel as well, but not like this. Different animal altogether. For starters, this has a far faster gear ratio. So when I turn that handle, I could fish this reel like a manual reel. I don't even need the power assist feature. But if I did want to use the power assist feature, which we do, of course, it's variable speed. I can go slow and, of course, determine the speed. It's got tremendous line capacity. And the key to this entire setup is this reel. This is what brings it all to life. This Beastmaster, I've got it loaded with 40 pound diamond braid, 40 pound. That's the key. There's over 2,000 yards of line, a more than a mile of line on the Shimano Beastmaster, 40 pound braid. You may think to yourself, wow, that seems really, really light, Mike. No, it's not. Do you know how strong 40 pound braid is? If it's not damaged, you can pull a truck with 40 pound braid. It's incredibly strong, okay? And not only is it strong, because it's so incredibly thin versus the 60 or 80 or 100 or whatever it is that you're fishing on these big, heavy, bulky reels, that means I don't need anywhere near as much lead. And even though you may not think that that small diameter in the braid can make such a big difference, you know what? In 10 feet of water, it doesn't make a difference because you only have a little bit of line out. In 800 feet of water, it makes a huge difference, huge. So 40 pound is the key to our deep dropping. And don't worry, it is strong enough to bring up anything that you could potentially hook. Next season, you're gonna see a show that we filmed deep dropping, and you'll see triple headers of yellow edge and snowy groupers that are this big, all being brought up on 40 pound braid. If that does not convince you that this is strong enough line, I don't know what will. Now, in addition, or on top of that 40 pound braid, because braid has no stretch whatsoever, and understand, my goal here tonight is to educate you. I'm getting right to the point. I'm telling you straight up exactly how we do it, why we do it, and what the benefits of doing it this way are. There's no fluff here. This is the real deal. It's been tested, and we've made mistakes. We've learned from those mistakes, and we've fine-tuned it right to this point right here. And that's why I'm so passionate and enthusiastic about it, because I know how well it works. And I want you to really start incorporating this into your deep dropping as well. Regardless of where you're deep dropping or what you're deep dropping for, point is, go lighter, go more sensitive, because it does make that big of a difference. However, that 40 pound braid, we know has no stretch at all. No stretch. Well, I need stretch because something has to give. There has to be some elasticity. With no elasticity, I'm gonna be pulling fish off, okay? I'm bringing up multiple fish, one, two, three sometimes, deep water. I've got a big lead on the bottom, okay? The boat's rocking up and down. The rod is bouncing up and down. The fish are all moving and spinning in different directions. You gotta have some elasticity. So we tie, sorry, the braid to 25 to 30 feet of 100 pound mono. 100 pound mono, 25 to 30 feet with an Alberto knot. Very streamlined, <clears throat> very easy to go in and out of the guides in a very easy knot to tie. An Alberto knot from the braid to the leader. The leader ends little glow bead, and the only reason that bead is there, anybody ever make the mistake of reeling a deep drop rig up into the rod tip without paying attention? You're bringing it up and it goes zee, pow, pow. And you're like, what just happened? And your rig is gone. Anybody ever do that? Only two people. I've done it. 
Okay, if you go deep dropping long enough, you're going to do it. It's going to happen. So this is just a little stopper, and it, you can just see it a little bit better. Um, and keep in mind, though, we have an auto stop feature, right? All of these power assist reels have an auto stop feature, meaning once you set it, the rig will stop when it's retrieving. So 20 feet from the surface, 10 feet from the surface, 50 feet, wherever it is that you want to set it, that reel will stop automatically to avoid that ever happening. Okay, so you literally will never lose a rig again as long as you, you know, set your reel properly. And they're very easy to set, by the way. You just drop your rig down to the point where you want it to stop. You hold the reset button in, it beeps, and boom. It's, it's set it and forget it from that point. We then crimp that 100-pound leader to a heavy-duty ball-bearing swivel snap swivel right there very important all of these little components are very important in this entire rig then there's a little light and it's a small little light little strobe you know there's an expression in deep dropping no light no bite that's not true okay you can catch fish without a light and there are times when you don't want that light one of those times is when you are specifically targeting the queen snapper because guess what that light attracts in addition to bottom fish sharks so when we're specifically targeting queen snappers we don't use a light when we're specifically targeting the snowy groupers and understand the queen snapper grounds and the snowy grouper grounds generally don't mix don't intermix okay we're either fishing for queens or we're fishing for snowies, two different habitats. So when we're fishing for the snowies, which mix with the tile fish, that's what you're gonna see mixed with the snowy grouper, are gray tile fish and yellow edge grouper, both great bycatches, wouldn't you agree? Okay, so in that scenario, we do use a light. From there, the rig, that's our next step. You can see first and foremost that my rig has zero schmeckle, zero crap on the hooks, right? Very, very clean, very streamlined. There it is, right there, it's a three hook rig. It's about 10 feet long, 12 feet long. It's 150 pound diamond leader material, okay, extra hard, Mamoy extra hard leader material on the trunk and the branches. Everything is the same, 150 pound. There are little swivel sleeves. This is just a small little swivel sleeve that slides down the leader, you then crimp it into position. Of course, you can come up here and take a, take a close look at the rig at the end of the seminar. You crimp it into position, and it doesn't move. It doesn't slide up or down. Then the branch comes off of it, crimped. All of my connections are crimped, and then I have a 9.0 VMC inline tournament circle hook, number 7385. That's the hook that we use for all of our deep dropping for queen snappers, gray tile fish, golden tile fish, snowy grouper. That's it. You only need one hook. It's a very thin hook, so it's easy for that fish to get hooked on its own. And understand, circle hooks are a must. Do not deep drop with J hooks. Why? Because, of course, you need a hook that's able to do its job on its own with no interaction from you. <clears throat> And again, that's crimped into position. We then go down the leader a little bit, and we have our second hook, and then we have our third hook. You do not need more than three hooks. How many fish are you trying to catch at one time, for the love of God? Is catching three fish not enough? Okay, I'm really only trying to catch one. That's it, I'm trying to catch one fish at a time. If I get lucky enough to catch a double, great. If I catch a triple, even better. But I'm not that greedy guy. You ever go deep dropping and you get a fish on, the rod's going, you know, it's bouncing, and you're like, wait, I want to get another one on. Wait, wait, no, no, don't push it yet. I want to get another one on. What, are you kidding me? You don't even know. It's down there eating your bait. It could be a 50-pound grouper because let me tell you something. It's 800 feet away. It could be even more than that depending on the depth that you're fishing. Okay, plus there's scope, your line is going down, there's a big bow of line. Do not think that you're fishing straight up and down. You're not fishing straight up and down. Your line looks like it's straight up and down, but it's not. It's going all the way down toward the bottom and it 
bows. It bows out. You're in deep water, the boat's drifting. Okay, so it bows out, especially the way I fish, which I'll explain in a moment. The more hooks that I put on my rig, the more resistance, the more junk that's in the water, which means the more lead that I'm going to need to keep that rig on the bottom, right? If I fish a one hook rig with a small bait, I'm not gonna need anywhere near as much lead as if I fished a five hook rig with five baits with glow beads and glow squids and tubes and all that other junk that they put on them, okay? I would then need a lot more lead. So my goal is a very clean, natural presentation. I am convinced that a snowy grouper who's on the bottom, 720 feet down, who's hungry, and he sees my bait and he smells it, and it's a fresh piece of king mackerel, okay, with a little squid on there just for the heck of it. And he swims up to it, he sees it, he smells it, and understand, they could see, they could see perfectly well down there where you think it's pitch black and icy cold, they can see, okay? And he sees that bait and he's about to eat it, and he says, wait, Wait, there's no glow bead on there. <laughs> there's no squid on there. There's no schmeckle on there. I can't, I'm not gonna eat that. I'm just not gonna eat it. And he's gonna swim away. On the contrary, of course not. He's gonna suck it down in a second, okay? Because that's what he is. He's, he's a game fish, he's a predator that's on the bottom, that's hungry. And you just put, you know, an amazing meal that's easy for him to eat right in front of him. Of course he's gonna eat it. So keep it very stealthy. That's always been my goal to success when it comes to deep dropping in this scenario. On the bottom of the rig, a second ball bearing, heavy duty snap swivel. Look at this lead, everybody watch. Look at that lead, see it spinning like a top? The entire way down and the entire way up, that's what that lead is doing. Do not think that this lead it's just gonna fall to the bottom just like that. Absolutely not, it's gonna spin. So if you do not have this swivel on the bottom and this swivel on the top, what's gonna happen to your rig? Destroyed. It's gonna be destroyed after one or two drops. It's gonna look like this, okay? And you guys know what I'm talking about that have been deep dropping, right? Your rig is just destroyed. I tell you what, the more time that I'm spending fixing rigs, undoing tangles, re-rigging branches and doing all of this junk, the less time that I've got a bait on the bottom and that I'm effectively fishing. So for me, it's about maximizing every second, every minute, every drift, every bait, every drop, I wanna maximize what I'm doing. So again, I'll fish that swivel on the bottom, the swivel on the top. There are also small swivels on these swivel sleeves, which allow the actual branches to spin because that too will spin on the way down. If you have a squid or a strip bait or a chunk bait, it's gonna spin like this. And then on top of that, the fish. You ever bring up a fish while you're deep dropping and you look in the water, we all do this, right? We're, where is it? Oh, there it is, I see something. That's part of the excitement of deep dropping. And the thing's going like this. It's spinning around the rig. And when you add all of these elements together, it's very easy to destroy a rig, which again is why you've got to have these swivels. Understand, there are a lot of deep drop rigs that are made out of much heavier mono, 300 pound. What are you fishing for? What are you trying to bring up from the bottom? I'm only fishing 40 pound braid. Why would I need a 300 pound leader? I don't, okay, I don't. It's stiff, it's easy to work with, but it's absolutely unnecessary. 150 pound is certainly plenty strong, it's, you know, obviously if it's not frayed or nicked or damaged. Much stealthier, much better presentation on your baits, and it's gonna be much more effective. Now, the final element to the rig is exactly what I just mentioned, that lead. When I'm fishing in up to 1,000 feet of water, while you're fishing 10 pounds of lead, I'm fishing three, right there. If I have to fish more lead than this right here, there's something wrong. And let me tell you how I get away with that. Because you may be saying to yourself, Mike, there's no way. 
There's no way in the world that you can drop a deep drop rig 800 feet to the bottom with one knot of current, two knots of current, and hold the bottom with just three pounds of lead. That's impossible. Well, it isn't, and I'll tell you why. Because I'll drop my rig to the bottom. And once it hits the bottom, while you lock up your reel and you put it in your rod holder and you drag it across the bottom, I do not. I'm in free spool. And I'm feeding my line out just like this. Okay, I'm slowly feeding it out at the same rate that the boat is drifting. My rig is not dragging across the bottom like your rig is. My rig is lying on the bottom. The entire thing, it hits the bottom. Three pounds is plenty of lead to get it down there. And I don't know if you can see this from back there, but look where all three of my baits are. Where's my baits? On the bottom. Where's the grouper feeding? On the bottom, okay? I leave all three of my baits right there and I'm feeding it out. I stop on the numbers where I want to fish. I'm convinced right here, right down there, 800 feet down is snowy groupers. I drop my bait right there. I hit the bottom. I'm in free spool. That's enough lead to keep that rig on the bottom. I feed it out. I feed it out. I feed it out. I'm holding this under my arm. Feel how comfortable that is. How light is that? Could you hold that under your arm? Very light. Yeah. Very light. Incredibly light for a deep drop outfit. 10 pounds. How about two pounds? Okay. And I'm just feeding it out, feeding it out, feeding it out. Now, every now and then, I'll put my thumb on the spool. I'll let the line tighten up and I'll feel, I'll feel if I feel any extra weight, if I'm feeling bites and I promise you, you will feel the bite. What I also promise you is as you are feeding it out, you will feel the bite. Even though your bail is open and you're feeding out line, you're paying out line, you're not just doing this. You know what I'm saying? You're not just feeding line out as fast as you can. On the contrary, I'm only feeding it out at the same rate that the boat is drifting. Okay, the line's gonna stay relatively tight. Not straight up and down, it's gonna scope out, but I'm leaving it relatively tight. Now, understand, this is why I said earlier where this reel is the magic part of this whole equation, because I've got a mile of line on here. I'll go down half a spool. What do I care? I'm not reeling it up like this, I'm pushing a button, right? I'm pushing a button. So I will literally leave this on the bottom and I'll feed it out, feed it out, feed it out, and I'm waiting for that bite. Now, maybe, depending on the speed of the current, depending on the drift, I may want to move my rig because guess what? After five to eight minutes, I haven't had a bite. And if I don't get a bite in five to eight minutes, I've got three juicy, smelly, delicious baits sitting right on the bottom. And these groupers, these tile fish, and you know, let's be honest with each other, even though we're targeting snowy grouper, you're gonna catch the tile fish also. They swim side by side. They're gonna sniff it out. Three baits, are you kidding me? They'll smell that from a mile away. In five to eight minutes, if I don't get a bite, I lock up the reel, I go into full speed, full speed. I lift the rig, picture this. I'm not dragging the rig across the bottom. I lift the rig up 100 feet off the bottom, boom, and then I go back into free spool. Here's my rig, it's sitting right here, Fished five to eight minutes, didn't get a bite, full speed. Rig comes up, boom, now it drops right here. And now I continue to feed it out. I'm hopping the rig across the bottom. Everybody picking up what I'm throwing down here? Don't drag it, hop it, okay? And you know what that's also going to avoid? What is that also going to avoid? Getting snagged. There's, excuse me, there's nothing that sucks more than getting snagged on the bottom when you're deep dropping. Am I right? You're talking about a lot of gear, a lot of line, a lot of time, and not only that, especially if you're fishing like 60 or 80 or 100 pound braid, that's not so easy to break. Okay, the rod's like <clears throat> doubled over. You're like, oh my God, what do I do? You're wrapping a line around a cleat and then it breaks right there and you lost all of that line. I've made all these mistakes. Okay, I've done it all. And I know, and trust me, if you deep drop enough, the same thing's gonna happen to you, okay? So to avoid getting snagged, don't drag the rig across the bottom, hop it across the bottom, 
okay? And if you keep doing that, you're gonna get bit. That's how I can get away with so much less lead because no matter how fast I'm drifting, the, the rig's not going anywhere. All I gotta do is just keep scoping it out, scoping it out. I got plenty of line. I'm not, I got a mile more. I'm not afraid to go all the way down. This is a fast reel. I'm trying to catch fish. I'm okay with that, okay? So that's how we successfully not only target and catch the snowies, but the yellow edges, the tile fish, while most people are just sitting back, dragging that rig across the bottom, the rig's way up here, because let me tell you something, I've sent cameras down there. Tile fish will not swim more than this far off the bottom, five feet. They're like little rats down there. It's pretty amazing to watch. But once they get a few feet off the bottom, they won't go up any higher. So if this rig is way up here, okay, like this, you're never gonna catch anything on this hook, okay? Because the tile fish won't swim up there. And even though we're talking about snowy groupers, like I said earlier, a 10, 12 pound big gray tile fish is a pretty damn good catch. And you won't catch them on there. But if the whole rig is lying on the bottom, Easy peasy, baby, you're gonna catch them all day long. And multiple fish, because it's easy for them to eat. They're comfortable eating down there. That's what they do. And again, the groupers are feeding right off the bottom as well. You know, that's the key to successful deep dropping for the snowy groupers. Is it the same for the queen snappers? No, no. There's some modifications that we make for the queen snappers. First, you hear that right there? Well, maybe do it in a mic. I don't know if you can hear it, but that little jingle right there of that hardware sometimes is enough, believe it or not, to spook the queen snappers. Queen snappers, the big ones, they're not dumb. These are really smart fish, these big queen snappers. And sometimes you have to resort to really sneaky tactics. You literally get rid of all of this. Just get rid of it all. Put one lead, you know, put your lead on your swivel and then use one swivel sleeve with a 20 foot leader. 20 foot leader, one hook, one bait. Drop it to the bottom. Reel it up 10 cranks off the bottom. Now you have a bait that is fluttering off the bottom. Queen snappers, while they feed on or near the bottom, are not per se a bottom fish like you would picture a grouper to be. Queen snappers will swim 50 to 100 feet off the bottom. The smaller queen snappers, the juveniles, they'll swim 300 feet off the bottom. The larger fish, the trophies that we're after, the 10 to 20 pound big queens, they're 50 feet off the bottom. That's why a lot of times when we target those fish, like I said, we'll hit the bottom, we'll reel up 10 cranks. And if there's a big hump, you know, down in the Keys, there's these things called humps. The Marathon hump, the Isle Morada hump. Anybody ever hear of these humps, right? They're pretty popular. Well, guess what? In addition to the tunas and the dolphin that these humps are notorious for, guess what's down there as well? Queen snappers, okay? And all other humps down there also. But the queens will hover over the humps. So sometimes if you position the boat properly and there's a big hump right there that comes off the bottom, the bottom is 800 feet deep, the top of the hump is 500 feet. Those queens are around, they're patrolling around that hump, feeding off of it just like other snappers. You know, when you go patchery fishing for yellowtails, where are the yellowtail snapper? In the bottom. When you go patchery fishing for yellowtails, where are the yellowtail snapper? They're right there. They're right next to the boat, are they not? Yep. They're right there. When you go fishing for mangrove snappers, it's a snapper, but he will be throughout the whole water column. When you go fishing for mutton snappers, they relate to the bottom, but they'll also come a ways off the bottom. It's the same with the queens. They're off the bottom. So don't drag your rig across that bottom. Reel it up. Don't be afraid to reel that rig 50 feet off the bottom and come across that hump with your rig suspended with one beautiful squid or a nice clean strip bait on a single hook fluttering 20 feet away from all of your junk, all of your lead. Are you gonna fool that queen now? 
now you've got a good chance of fooling a big trophy queen snapper. That's a big difference between targeting those queens and the snowies is that approach. Okay, it's how you look at that fish, how that fish behaves, you know, what are the characteristics of that fish, what do I need to do to catch that fish. A couple other things. There are certainly going to be scenarios where this light outfit just isn't going to work. Just not going to work. I'm going to tell you that, you know, first and foremost, 500 to 800 feet deep, that's what this is designed for. But then there are scenarios where I'm not going to be able to effectively fish the bottom with only three pounds. I do need to step it up to five pounds. Okay, which to you, you may say five pounds is light. To me, I'm like, oh God, I got to use five pounds, but I will. In that scenario, I bring another pair of rods. Look, they look pretty similar, right? But this rod is rated for 30 to 60 pound. This rod is rated for 50 to 100 pound. However, there's no reel on here. I don't need a reel because I have a reel right here. It's on a bent butt. All I got to do is unscrew it, pop it onto this and I have an entirely new heavier outfit. I don't need a bigger reel. So anytime we go deep dropping, I always bring, and by the way, we always fish two rods, always. We're fishing one rod right up here in the bow and I'm right here, that's my spot. So I can constantly monitor my, my fish finder, my chart plotter, and there's somebody else, my brother, my wife, whoever it may be is fishing up in the bow. We're always fishing two deep drop rods. Sometimes you can get away with fishing even more, okay? One way that we do that also, you know those little cords that all your power assist reels come with, the Daiwa Tanacoms, even the Beastmaster, and the cords like this long. Look at my cord. Do me a favor, grab that. Doop, doop, doop. Look where I'm at. You know what that means? That means once I plug that cord into the boat, I have unlimited mobility around the boat with my deep drop rod. You can drop it. So I extend them because let me tell you what happens. You could set your boat up. I'm right here. I drop a bait right here. The boat's drifting this way, okay? My line's going this way as I drop it. It gets to the bottom, and then this magical thing happens, and the line suddenly goes, and it's back here somewhere, okay? And, and I'm like, what in the world? There's just a weird drift or current, and I then have to pick up the rod and go over top of the motors or walk up this way. You gotta maneuver around the boat. And if I'm tethered with a little six-foot cord, I'm stuck. So I extend all of the cords. So the guy up in the bow has 30 foot cord. In the stern, I got a 30 foot cord and we can move all around the boat. It's a small little detail that'll make a big difference when you're deep dropping, regardless if you plug in or if you clip onto batteries, right? And I know, you know, lately, what is that thing called? The real battery or something, okay? I know guys are using that kite fishing, I don't know if that real battery has enough juice. Maybe it does, I'm not saying it doesn't. I, I don't have enough experience with it, but enough juice to fish a deep drop outfit all day long. Does it? Not all day, okay, not, not all day. So I don't wanna deal with that either because that's just another thing that I'm dealing with that I don't wanna have to deal with. I wanna focus on catching fish. So instead I prefer to plug in and actually aboard my 39 CV, I've got an outlet up here. I have a center outlet for sorting. I have another one back here and another one in the other corner. So we have four outlets. If you're gonna be serious about this, do it the right way, okay? And set your boat up the right way so you could easily plug in. You're not trucking batteries around. You're not worrying about, you know, charging batteries or anything to that nature. Let's get back to this for a second. So I'm feeding my bait out and I feel that boom, 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 boom. And you're gonna feel it, even though your bail is open. Because again, there's not a lot of slack. I don't want you to think I'm just freely scoping out, you know, paying out line. I'm not, I'm only paying out enough line. I'm picturing this in my head. I'm picturing my rig lying on the bottom and the boat slowly moving away. And like I said, I'm just trying to extend that gap without moving the rig. And there's a fine line there because if I hold it, I start dragging it. And then if I start dragging it and there's a lot of current, the rig comes up off the bottom, 
and boom, I don't catch those fish when it comes to the snowies. So when I do feel that bite, the very first thing that I do is I just keep paying it out. I don't do anything, okay? Because I want to let him eat it. I don't want to pull it away from him. And even though I'm feeling that mm, 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 from 800, 900 feet away, and sometimes even more, okay? Because remember, I've been scoping this out. I could be a third of the way down the spool, which could be 2,000 feet of line. I could be 2,000 feet away from my rig. Think about that distance, okay? And you still feel that. Chances are the fish has got it. He's hooked. All right, he's hooked. He's not nibbling. He's trying to swim in the other direction. He's hooked. But still, I want to be sure. So I'm going to let out a little bit more line, let out a bit, little bit more line, and then I'll hold it. I'll hold it tight, and if I still feel that fish at that point, I lock it up, and I start cranking manually. And I go manually, because the hardest part of that fight is the first 30 seconds. And in that first 30 seconds, you're going to know what size fish you have on. Okay, you're gonna know, because if you cannot get him off the bottom, if he won't move, that rod is just doubled over and you're not gaining any line, that's not a three pound snowy grouper. Okay, that's a 30 pound snowy grouper. And at that point, remember now what's happening. I've got a ton of line out. I've got a big fish or multiple fish that are really far away from me. The boat is going this way, away from the fish, and I'm trying to get this thing off the bottom. And I'm only fishing 40. Remember where I'm standing, right here. So if I'm convinced or really believe I've got a big fish on, I lock up and I'm like, oh God, I can't get him off the bottom. And I get really excited about deep dropping. I just want to tell you that. If you come deep dropping with me, you better be prepared. All right, because I get really excited when I hook a big fish deep dropping. Much more excited than I probably should be, but I do. At that point, I may immediately, literally, I've got the rod in my hand and I reach over and I put the boat in gear. And I turn that wheel and I start going toward the fish. I push that lever forward, not full speed, slowly, slowly. It's variable speed, okay? You don't have to go full speed. If you go full speed, this thing is yee! It's cranking a ton of line. You're putting a tremendous amount of pressure and you could easily pull a hook out of that fish. So I literally just go up relatively slow. I'll turn that boat and I'm now trying to just close that gap. Here's the fish, here's the boat, and I'm going like this while I'm reeling up. This is only for bigger fish, just like this. And eventually, you'll get to this point, you'll get the fish up off the bottom and slowly bringing them up, slowly. The further he gets up off the bottom, then of course you can increase speed a little bit, but never go full bore on a big fish. There's just no reason to. Okay, you're, you risk pulling that fish off. And keep in mind, the guy up in the bow, the same scenario. If he hooks a big fish and I'm right here and he can't get him off the bottom, I'm going to do the same thing. And I understand all I have to do is reel up my slack. It's a matter of communication. If you're only fishing one rod, of course, you don't have to worry about that. If you're fishing two rods, I assure you that whoever is standing here knows that I just hooked a big fish. They know it. There's no confusion. They know, I hooked a big fish. So, and you'll see that too on that episode that I mentioned to you, okay, that's coming out next year there in January. Use the boat to your advantage. Why not? That's what it's there for. The boat's, you know, it's running. Put, put it in gear, one engine, two engines, three engines, eight engines, now, you know, who knows what kind of boat you have, but nevertheless, close that gap, okay? Just slowly close the gap. Put in just enough pressure, understand that fish, think about how big that fish is, and trust me, he's got the advantage at that point because he is so far away and he's not gonna wanna come off the bottom. His life revolves around that bottom. Snowy groupers do not live in the middle of the water column, up in the water column, they live and feed on or near the bottom. Their entire life revolves around that bottom. And when you try and pull them out of that, you know, away from that seafloor, they're not going to just easily come off the bottom. They're going to fight for their lives, okay? And that, that first part of the battle is the most important. Once they're coming up through the water column, and especially once they get barotrauma, anybody know what that is? Grouper eyes about this big, 
right? Their, their intestines are coming out their butt, right? They blow up because of the pressure change. It's called barotrauma. Then they'll just float. Then it's easy at that point because the fight's over. The fish isn't fighting. You're now just bringing up the dead weight essentially through the water column, and he's floating. You almost don't need to do anything. You just need to reel and retrieve enough line, okay, to keep up with the fish as it's floating. And instantly, you know if it's a snowy grouper. As it's getting close to the surface, your line is scoping out. It's scoping out away from the boat because that grouper is floating. And if you start to see bubbles, bubbles, that's a snowy grouper. He's exhaling the bubbles. They're coming out of his body. And all big snowy groupers, you'll see bubbles before you'll see the grouper. Of course, depending on the conditions. If it's choppy, obviously you won't see it. If it's calm, you will see it. That's how we target the snowies off the keys in the Gulf of Mexico. A little bit of a different scenario. Deep water is way out in the Gulf, 100 miles or so. We're not typically on a daily basis fishing out there aboard our boat. You know, we will fish a few times in a year on a head boat called the Yankee Captains. Anybody ever hear of the Yankee Captains? Right? Great boat, still. Greg's a little crazy, okay? But nevertheless, they'll put you on some great deep dropping offshore there. And a lot of guys will fish a similar rig like this, and some of them will do it you know, the way that we just discussed. But it's a different scenario out there because there's often a lot less current. There's a lot less current out there than there is here. Plus, you're fishing on a boat with 20 other people that are deep dropping. Okay, the boat's not moving for you. So it's, it's a different animal altogether. Off the Keys, the Bahamas, you're fishing, you know, smaller boat, you're able to maneuver more. With the queens, it's a different battle altogether. The queen snapper doesn't care as much about the bottom as the snowy grouper does because the queen snapper, you know, like I said, like a lot of other snappers, will come up off the bottom. Not all the way to the surface, but you're good. I won't get that out of your way. I don't want to stick you. Okay? But he will come up off the bottom. So the queen snapper is going to be a different kind of fight. That rod's going to be bouncing and fighting. And you know he's going to be fighting almost all the way to the surface. It's going to be completely different than the grouper. And, and you'll know. Because again, we typically target these fish in different areas. So that's basically an overview of how we're deep dropping for the snowies, for the queens. Now, there is another way. And absolutely my favorite way to catch these fish, and that's jig fishing. Okay, everybody has heard of slow pitch jigging. Everybody heard of slow pitch jigging? Okay. And really it's opened up a whole new arena and a whole new way for us to target these fish. Because years ago, this was really the only way. It was putting a multiple hook rig with baits on heavier gear, you know, even not this light, obviously, but much heavier gear. And that was the only way to really deep drop. Now, man, I'll tell you what, there are a few things that are as exciting as dropping a jig 800 feet down and hooking a big 20 pound queen snapper. It's a great battle. It's a one on one kind of fight, but it requires specialized tackle. Okay, very, very, very specialized tackle. Or you will be that person who drops a jig one time, 800 feet down, doesn't get a bite, you're reeling up, and you're looking at me. Are you crazy? You go, Mike, I, you're crazy. I can't do this all day long, right? Because you got to do it the right way, and you have to have the right mindset. First, let's talk about the tackle, and then we'll talk about the technique. We'll start with the rod. In order to do this effectively, you need a rod that, for starters, is incredibly light, okay, incredibly light. Because if it's heavy, it's going to be really challenging, right, for you to jig all day or for, you know, multiple drops or however long you want to do it with an outfit that's really heavy. So you need something that's really, really light. We custom build specific rods. This is a rod that actually you're looking at the very first 
first, and when I say first, I mean the very first one built by Chaos. This is a rod that we've been designing for a while, and I just picked them up an hour before the seminar. They brought them here for me. It's a seven foot rod. It's made out of Torre carbon fiber, basically like a bulletproof vest. It's that strong, but amazingly light. Can you put that in your hand right there? How? Really light. Really light, right? Much lighter than you would think that it would be. So it's very comfortable, but it's incredibly strong. You literally can pull almost any size fish off the bottom with this thing. You can bend it into a giant U. It's not gonna break okay, because of the material that it's made out of. The rod itself is spiral wrap or acid wrap. Different people call it different things. What does that mean? See the guides? See how the guides start on the top and end on the bottom? Okay, we built you know, similar rods like this for people, and I've shipped them to them, and they've called me and went, Mike, man, you guys messed up. The guy wrapping the rod must have been drunk as a skunk, because look at the guides on this thing. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> okay, three reasons for this. Number one, it helps prevent spinning of the rod in your hand. Number two, no matter what load I put on this rod, no matter how hard this rod is bent over, the line itself will never touch the blank. And that's really important when it comes to the braid because braid is super fragile. It's super strong, incredibly strong, as long as it's not damaged. Braid is just that. It's eight microfibers, depending on the braid that you choose, eight or nine microfibers that are braided together to create this incredibly thin fishing line. Well, if you took this incredibly thin fishing line and unwrapped it, imagine how thin each of those eight strands would be. If you damaged just one of those eight by leaning this up against a concrete seawall or one of so many different reasons, with the naked eye, you wouldn't even see that damaged part in the braid. And if you have a damaged area and a weak link, you know what's gonna happen? Somebody tell me, you know, what's that famous line? Zing pow. zing pow, baby. You hook a fish and it's zing pow, and it breaks off. Because you didn't even know that you had a weak link in your braid. You never saw it. You, it was going to be impossible for you to see. Okay, impossible. So it's really, really important that you do everything you can do to prevent that braid from getting damaged. And that's one big reason for the acid wrap. Another reason is when we're jigging. There's a lot of motion involved with jigging, slow pitch jigging, jigging in general. If this line, every time I came up, watch what happens. I'm gonna turn the rod upside down for a second. Look at the guides. When I go up jigging, see if we can demonstrate this, and I'm moving, that line could very easily do that. See that, how it got stuck on that guide? And trust me when I tell you, if you jig enough, it will constantly get wrapped on that guide. So by turning it and putting the guide on the bottom of the blank, that line now, when it touches the top of the rod on the upswing of a jig, of a, of a pitch, whoop, it slides right off. And it'll never get hung up on the tip of the rod. So there's really three reasons for that acid wrap. In addition to that, you can see that it's blank through construction, goes all the way to the back. Like I said, very sensitive, very parabolic. Parabolic meaning springy. Doop. Look at that. Doop. It springs back into action. So when I drop this jig 800 feet down, okay, and I move that rod and I pitch that jig, the rod itself loads and unloads, loads and unloads loads and unloads and every time it unloads it pitches the jig across the bottom it pitches it it throws it that's why it's called slow pitch jigging not because somebody's pitching it's because that rod every time it bounces up pitches the jig off to the side okay and it allows the jig to do what it was designed for so it's a very very special rod oh you're going to pay for it too trust me when i tell you somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 bucks plus just for the rod. It's matched 
to what is perhaps the finest jigging reel ever created. Not perhaps, to unequivocally what is the finest jigging reel ever created. This is a Shimano Oshia Jigger 4000. We fish a 2000 model for everything relatively shallow, 100 to 500 feet. In this depth of water, we fish a 4000 for a couple different reasons. First and foremost, it's cranking power, the torque on this reel. Look at this big T-bar and this big ratio. Let's see if we can. When I go all the way around, every turn retrieves more than four feet of line. Okay, and there's just tremendous torque. So I don't feel the weight of that jig when I'm reeling it up from deep water. If I felt the weight of that jig, I wouldn't be able to do it either. Okay, but by not feeling it, all you're doing is finding a rhythm and just turning. Very casually, you find a nice rhythm, and even though you're only going this fast, that jig is flying back up to the surface at a super high rate of speed. In addition to that super silky smooth star drag, look at the size of that star drag. Very easy to adjust with your thumb or your fingers. They make it super simple. Most importantly, watch this feature. You guys hear that? I'm in free spool. All I have to do is turn the handle and the reel locks and the reel shifts into gear. Why is that important? I'm dropping down. My jig is going all the way to the bottom. You know, my finger's on the line, it's racing down, suddenly I'm completely slack. What happened? Fish on. Fish on, baby. Immediately, I don't want to fumble around. All I have to do is just, boom, just start cranking, 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 and come tight immediately and hook that, excuse me, and you'll hook that fish. So that's another really nice feature. Plus, it holds a tremendous amount of line. 20 pound braid, 20 pound. I cannot tell you how much line is on this reel, but I can tell you when I drop this jig 800 feet down, it doesn't even look like I've touched the line that's on the reel, okay? And that's very important. Why? Because if this reel was almost empty, when I hit the bottom and I go to reel in this line, I'm not gaining anything because there's nothing on the spool. But by the spool staying full, then I'm gaining maximum retrieve, you know, maximum amount of return on the line with every turn of the handle. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's all of these features combined, plus the material, the corrosion resistance, and all the other good stuff that Shimano puts into this. It's just, honestly, the best jigging reel you'll ever use in this class. Finally, it's coupled with what has become my absolute favorite deep water jig. Now you guys may look at that thing, which by the way has um, funky shapes on the back side there, little glitter on the front. It's not center weighted. If you look at it, the weight is just a little bit offset. It's not right in the middle. It's just a little bit offset right there. The name of this jig is called an enforcer. It's 400 grams and will generally fish a 400 or 500 gram jig. How many grams in an ounce? Come on, from your high school days, 28 grams, right? So how much does this 400 gram jig weigh in ounces? Somebody tell me that. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're like, well, we all failed. Either way, it's heavy as shit, <laughs> okay? It's like a pound, right? Right? It's, it's heavy, very, very heavy, and you need a heavy jig to get to the bottom quickly. And the way that this jig is designed, keep in mind, under load, under load meaning when this line is tight, when this line is tight and there's tension, this jig falls like this. It does not fall like this, it falls like this, like a bullet. And it literally will race to the bottom as fast as it can go, right to the bottom. And you want to keep that reel in free spool with your thumb on the spool to prevent backlashing, but with no tension. Let it go. If you put any tension on there, you're going to slow it down. Let it go because you want to get it to the bottom as quick as you possibly can. Once it gets to the bottom, you lock it up 
and you start pitching and jigging this reel using a combination of the rod and the reel. And while this is not a slow pitch seminar, okay, you get the gist of it. And what happens at that point is this jig is no longer being fished vertically. Now every time you pitch it, it goes off to the side and it wobbles and swims and then you pitch it again and it goes off to the side and it wobbles and it swims and I'm telling you what, I used to have a different jig which I still use, it was called the Mobster. You've heard me talk about it before, I'm sure you, know, you may have seen other seminars, whatever. And I love the Mobster, I've caught a tremendous amount of fish on the Mobster until I got my hands on the Enforcer. And while these are funky names, I'm not the one that named them, I'm just telling you. This shape is just incredible. And I've had amazing success. And one day, I caught a squid on this jig. And the squid was the same size of the jig. And when I reeled it up and I came out of the water and there was a squid hanging off of it, which is not uncommon because the squid thought that this was a squid, okay? And he actually wasn't attacking it to eat it, he was attacking it to mate with it, okay, and happened to just get hooked. And when I took him off the hook and I held this side by side, it was identical, identical in size, shape, color, formation, everything to a natural squid that was this big. And when I start fishing this and you see the action that it has, it mimics a squid better than any other lure I've ever seen in my entire life. And what do groupers and snappers feed on in deep water? Hot dogs. <laughs> now that shit's funny. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Nevertheless, so you're matching the hatch perfectly, perfectly. And I'm telling you, everything eats these. This is not, you know, I'm not promoting this, I'm simply telling you that if you're going to go deep water jigging, you've got to do it the right way, and it's a combination of line, leader, rod, reel, and jig. The line, as I mentioned, 20 pound braid, and at first, at first I said to myself, 20 pound braid? Man, you want me to drop a jig that weighs more than a pound, a thousand feet down for golden tile fish, or snowy groupers, or queen snappers in extreme depths under extreme conditions where I have the potential of hooking an extremely large fish. Because let me tell you something, not only do snappers and groupers eat squid, so do 70 pound amberjack, okay? So do 70 pound amberjack. And you don't know that it's a 70 pound amberjack because you know what you're praying that it is? A giant grouper. Right, you're like, oh my God, I just hooked a 50 pound snowy or a giant yellow edge or a Warsaw or it's just some amazing thing. No, you hooked a 70 pound amberjack. <laughs> but you have to fight them all the way to the boat, okay? And I'm telling you what, the 20 pound braid will hold up in that scenario easily because there's something on the reel called a drag, right? And as long as your drag is set properly, you can fight any size fish on 20 pound test. And as long as that 20 pound braid, which I don't even know why they call it 20 pound because it should be called like 200 pound. Braid is that incredibly strong, especially fresh new braid, okay? But the difference again, just like on the deep drop where the 40 pound is ultra thin and allows you to fish less weight with less scope, it's the same scenario with the jig, okay? I can fish a lighter jig Less scope, because in order for this jig to be effective, you've got to fish it as vertical as possible. I mean, vertical like this, your line. When you're scoped way out there, the jig is just not going to move the way that you need it to. So you want to be as vertical as you can possibly be. And that 20 pound test allows you to do that. We connect that 20 pound to 40 pound presentation fluorocarbon with that same knot, an Alberto knot. Same, it's almost the same. 20, 40, 40, 100. I know those numbers are different, but top shot, braid, Alberto knot, essentially the same concept, okay? Long leader, about 30 foot, for stretch, okay? Because remember, chances are 
you've got that fish hooked, but this isn't all the way in his gut, okay? Rarely will this entire jig be in that fish's mouth. Chances are you're going to have two hooks in his, you know, in his mouth, and the other two hooks are going to be in his head, on his side, in his butt, wherever. That's what these jigs do. They're deadly. Okay, and a lot of guys, by the way, in deep water, rather than fishing dual or tandem assist hooks, they'll fish a single hook, a single on the bottom and a single on the top, just to avoid snagging the fish, fouling the jig. You know, you don't necessarily need the tandem assist hooks. You can see there are two hooks on the bottom, two on the top. Okay, but, you know, it's a matter of preference and both will work. I fish the tandem because I just want to kill everything I catch. So, but nevertheless, and I don't want to miss any bites. So this is perhaps, you know, as I mentioned, the funnest way that you can target the snowy groupers, the queen snapper. Is it the most effective way? You know, some people say no. I'm going to tell you on a recent trip on the Yankee captains, and we filmed it, the entire thing, 20 guys, 19 of them for three days, fished bait. One guy, one guy who completely lost his mind, okay, for three days, did nothing but jig. He fished a rod very, very similar to this with that jig. We all want to guess who that guy is, right? Smoked everybody, okay, and caught more than everyone on the boat. Now, keep in mind, I fished hard. I don't give up, and a lot of guys didn't. But nevertheless, the point I'm making is it can be just as effective as fishing bait. And what the guys didn't realize, and this was kind of a perfect scenario, I've got 19 guys chumming for me. <laughs> right? I've got 19 guys that are dropping down bait, smelly baits. They were catching fish, a lot of activity, a lot of bait. A lot of squid, a lot of meat, all sorts of stuff that they're dropping. And I'm up in the pulpit jigging away with my squid. Every drop, boom, boom, boom. Not every drop, but you follow what I'm saying. Okay. Now, that boat also offers jig-only trips. I'm not going on a jig-only trip. <laughs> nope. I'm not going on a jig-only trip. I'm going on a regular trip, and I'm going to jig on a chum trip. Okay, that, that's how I look at it. They're all doing me a favor. They're catching fish, but I'm no idiot. I'm watching what's going on, and of course that creates this whole, you know, world down there that's just perfect for jigging. And plus, everything eats squid. So while you're targeting, you know, the, the queens, I can specifically do more than what somebody can do with bait. And what do I mean by that? Look, I know the queen snappers are suspended off the bottom. I hit the bottom, I work my jig, and I work it 50 to 80 feet off the bottom. And 50 to 80 feet off the bottom, pow, you get smacked. What is it? It's a big queen every time. On the other hand, I drop my jig to the bottom, and I work it 10 feet off the bottom and right back down. 10 feet, right back down. 10 feet, boom, you get hit. What is it? A tile fish. Okay, because they live right on or near the bottom. I don't want to catch the gray tile fish. I can catch them here or wherever. I want to catch the queens, so I work it higher, you know, off the bottom. Not such an easy thing to do, you know, with this kind of rig. So there's huge advantages, in my opinion, plus it's just so incredibly rewarding. Not for everyone, but incredibly rewarding and incredibly effective as well. Finally, look, when you're out there, deep drop you got to maximize on every opportunity. I'm that guy who says that one fish makes a difference. If you went out deep dropping, and I don't care if you didn't catch anything, but you caught a 40-pound bull dolphin, did you have a good day? Yeah. Hell yeah, you did, right? I'll take a 40-pound bull dolphin every day of the week. You're never going to catch that bull dolphin if you don't fish for dolphin. Well, I'm not specifically out there dolphin fishing. I'm deep dropping or I'm jigging. But you bet your ass I got a spinner right here and I got another spinner right here, a Chaos SP 15 to 30 pound class, 7 foot rod, Shimano Saragossa 10,000. Perfect combination. It's loaded with braid, okay, but it's got a top shot of monofilament or fluorocarbon with a live bait hook. I'm fishing squid. What am I going to put on the hook? A whole squid. 
That's all I need. I don't need any special bait. I'm going to chuck it out off the bow. I'm going to chuck it out off the stern. I'm going to leave them locked up in a rod holder on every drift. You're in dolphin territory. You're offshore. You, you, you're, you're, missing a, you're missing a boat, so to speak, if you don't at least have a couple of dolphin baits out. Are you going to catch them every time? No, but you'll never catch them if you don't try it and it doesn't take you any extra effort. You're there anyway. Maximize on every opportunity. And I also want to say, look, while you're deep dropping for queens, while you're deep dropping for snowies, like I said, gray tile fish, they're predominant. They're probably the most predominant bottom fish, you know, deep drop fish there is other than those damn black belly rose fish, right? Which we all know, you guys fish for those black bellies? They're great. I mean, they're absolutely delicious. They're a day saver. They're fun to catch. And they're everywhere. You know, you can catch them three, four, five at a time. There's, you could sink the boat with those damn things. They don't freeze very well, but great for ceviche and like a lot of fun to catch. And I mean, talk about an odd looking critter, right? With that big eye and the spines. I mean, plus they're beautiful, okay? So you'll catch those, but what are some other stuff that you may catch on the bottom? How about blackfin tunas? 800, 900 feet down, 30 pound blackfin tuna. You're like, what in the world are you doing down there, son? Okay, absolutely a possibility. Barrel fish, okay, not so much here, even though there are some barrel fish on a ledge outside of Fort Lauderdale, which we'll talk about that just, you know, for one second, but they're very common down in the Keys, common in the Gulf. That's a great catch that their barrel fish will be suspended off the bottom with the queens, okay, and here, like I said, off Fort Lauderdale, there's a ledge. The one secret that the guys do here is the lead that they put on the bottom of the rig. Instead of it being a long sash weight type of deep drop lead, they'll use a downrigger ball, okay? A round downrigger ball because you will contact the bottom and the bottom out here is very sticky. What does sticky mean? Hangy. As soon as your rig touches the bottom, eh, you're hung up because that lead seems to get hung in the bottom, the hooks get hung, so they'll fish a round ball lead, like, a, like I said, like a deep drop, uh, not a deep drop, a downrigger ball, and that helps avoid getting tangled when you're specifically targeting the barrel fish here, specifically. But that's another fish that you can catch, you know, like I said, as bycatch to what you're targeting. So there's a lot of other possibilities out there, and obviously a lot of possibilities in between where you're leaving and the deep drop grounds. So hopefully you picked up a couple of tips. You know, hopefully you kind of look at deep dropping a little bit differently than you did when you got here tonight. And even if you take one thing away from this tonight that helps you catch more fish, then I've done my job. So that wraps this up, guys. Thank you so much. All right.